Hello, welcome back to Essentials of Computer Architecture, Computer Architecture and Organization. And today we're going to be doing the last chapter in this third major section that Coomer has in his textbook. And we'll be talking about a programmer's view of devices, input, output, uh, input and output, and buffering. So we'll just go ahead and get into this. So um, you probably have heard the term a device driver and uh, uh, what that is, it's a, it's a piece of software that's responsible for communicating with a specific device. And so there's a lot of um, implementation details that are hidden that aren't necessary for the CPU, an operating system, an application to know, except for the, the standard interfaces, um, sharing of information. And so it's usually included as a part of the operating system and it performs some basic functions. It initializes the devices, it man manipulates the device um, CSRs to start operations when an input operation is needed and it handles um, interrupts from the device. So let's get into this a little bit more and answer the question, well, what exactly is a device driver? It's an encapsulate, it, it includes encapsulization and hiding. The details of the device is hidden from the application software. Once again, some information that it doesn't need to do its job in its application. And the, for device independent applications, the application code does not contain the details for any specific devices. So there's three conceptual parts of a device driver. There's a lower half, the upper half, and stuff that's shared in the, in the, in the middle. And we'll show a picture of this shortly. So the lower half, this is the, the handler code that is involved when the device interrupts. It, it communicates directly with the device that is um, to reset the hardware. So that's the lower half of the upper half. It's a set of functions that are involved invoked by application, allows the application to request input and out operations. And in the, the middle, there's um, shared va variables that are used by both halves to coordinate. It contains input and output buffers. So this is what it looks like. And so there's a hardware facing portion, there's an application facing portion, and then there's a shared variables, and then there's a translation that goes from one to another. So the application program is the upper half that is invo invoked by the application. So the uh, application interfaces on, on that part. And then there's a device hardware side with the lower half that is invoked by the interrupts. And so it knows exactly how to be sharing the information with the hardware in the right format. So um, what type of devices are there? Um, there is character oriented type of devices so there's, where there's a transfer one byte at a time. An example would be keyboard or a mouse. There can be block oriented, which transfers um, blocks of data at a time. So examples would be a disk or a network interface. And so here's an example of the flow in a, a network device. And so here we're trying to show eight different steps. And so first, this, the, the first step is the application sends data over the, the internet. And so this is the application comes into there. Um, and then that application sends it down to the, the protocol. So protocol software passes a packet to the driver. So it's moving its way down. So um, it goes down to the, the into the upper half, the driver stores the outgoing packet to the, the shared variables. So then we go there, um, we, it's going through this um, device driver down to the variables. Um, and then from, from there, um, the, the upper half specifies the packet location and, and starts the device. So we see that. So there's, it, it tells the device that it needs to, to, to get going to, um, then the, the upper half returns uh, to the, the protocol module. The, the protocol software returns to the application, the device interrupts in the lower half of the box. 
uh, half of the driver executes and the lower half removes the copy of the packet from the, the variable. So we're, we're seeing how we're, we're just taking this one step at a time. So, and we, we get things started and then the, there's the percolation of information back up and, and out. So um, what about queued output operations? It used, it's used by most device drivers. It's a shared variable area containing um, queues of, of uh, a queue of requests. And the upper half places queue requests on queue. The lower half moves to the next request on queue when an operation completes. If um, the device supports operation chaining, the upper half can handle new items to the queue while the device is processing. This um, would take coordination. And so here is an illustration of an output request queue. So here we have an up, upper half. Then there's this um, queuing function in the variables that we can have. And then it goes down to the lower half. So the queue is shared uh, among both halves. The driver software is designed so that each half ensures the other half will not examine or change the queue at the same time. So let's talk about managing an output queue. At startup, um, it, you want to initialize a queue to empty when an application performs a write in the upper half. Um, it deposits data, data item in the queue. It forces the device to interrupt and it returns to the application. When an interrupt occurs in the lower half, it extracts the next item from the queue and starts output if the queue is not empty. It allows the device to remain idle if the queue is empty and then it returns from interrupt. So you can see how there's um, um, two different ways that are interrupt um, what, what is actually going on, upper or the lower half. So we talked about that. That's the, the input queue. And now we'll talk about, I mean, the, we, first we talked about the output queue. And now we'll talk about managing an input queue. At startup, we initialize the queue to empty and start the device. Um, I'm sorry, let me just back up here. So we have the, the, the output. And so we have these the similar two parts, um, just like as we're talking about both the output and the input. And so for an output, when we, we're talking about a write, and um, for an input, we're talking about a read. And so they're, they're similar, but um, that's, that's what I'm trying to convey here. So for a write, we deposit data, force the, interrupt, the device to interrupt, return to the application for the upper half. Interrupt occurs from the lower half, extract the next item, allow the device to remain idle and return from interrupt. And then for the input, this is a read function. We extract and return the, the next item in the queue. If the queue is not empty, the, the block application, the blocks applications if the input queue is empty. And when the interrupt occurs, the lower half starts another input operation. Um, it allows the application to run and then returns from interrupt. So, what about mutual, mutual exclusion? This is needed because interrupts occur asynchronously and multiple applications can attempt input output on a given device at the same time. It guarantees only one operation will be performed at any time. The device driver handles mutual exclusion. So what about um, an input output interface for application? Few programmers write device drivers. Instead of dealing directly with devi devices, most programmers use high level abstraction. So um, files instead of disks, windows instead of display screens. And so that was a, the, the types of um, abstractions that were typical. So um, a typical application invokes um, runtime library function to, pour, to perform input output. The chief advantage of this is input output hardware and or device drivers can be changed without changing applications. So let's talk about this some, some more and programming interfaces for an IO library. So we have the application, uh, we have a runtime library and then we have a device driver. And so, um, and that's what we're trying to, to give a little bit more insight here with the, these runtime libraries. 
So here's an example of two interfaces. Um, first is a Unix library call, and the second is a Unix system call. And so the, the first one, a library call, we're talking about um, print and, and read and um, the, the type of specific operations. So you generate formatted output or you read formatted data. So that would be an example um, of library functions. And then for system call, it would be open, read, write, close, seek, um, and other miscellaneous control functions. And so this is um, more an operating system. These are the kind of things that probably would most likely be done in an application for the, the upper group. So what about reducing the cost of input output operations? Uh, the two principles are cost of making a system call is much more expensive than the cost of making the conventional function call. The approach used to reduce system calls consists of transferring more data per call. So let's talk about buffering. Um, this is important for optimization. It's widely used. It's uh, usually automated and invisible to a programmer. And the key idea is make large input output transfers to the driver. Um, so you accumulate large blocks of out outgoing data before you do the transfer. And when it's full, then you do the transfer. So then you transfer the large block of incoming data and then extract individual items. So you get a big fetch and then you process. Um, hi you can do hiding of the buffers from the programmers. That can be an example of something that's not necessary for them to know the details. Um, so it's typically performed with library functions. And if you think in terms of applications, um, it uses functions in the library for all input and output and transfers data in arbitrarily small amounts. For library functions, the buffer data, um, it, it, it does buffering of data from application and it's uh, transferring data to underlying system in, in large blocks. So here's an example um, of functionality used for buffering. Um, and so the device driver in the operating system may also perform buffering to reduce number of transfers between the processor and the device. And so here's a couple of operations um, set up input, output, terminate, and flush. And so if you're trying to flush a buffer, buffer if you're trying to um, uh, set it up and initialize it, you're tr talking about doing input and output operations and um, having the possibility of just continuing the use of a buffer. So what about using a buffering library for, for output? Um, so in a setup function, you're, you can, uh, can imagine you have is, um, it would be called to initialize the buffer. It, it may allocate the buffer in a, in a typical buffer size would be 8K to 128K bytes. So that would be for a setup function, for an output function. It's called when an application needs to emit data. Um, it places data places the data I'm in the buffer and it only writes to an IO device when the buffer is full. And then in terms of a terminate function, it's called when all the data has been emitted and it, it forces remaining data in the buffer to be written. So here's an example of what implementation of output buffer functions could look like in a rough pseudocode Form. And so for setup, you want to allocate a buffer and then you create a, a pointer to that buffer. An output is you place data bytes D in a buffer in a, in a certain position. And then you want, and if the buffer is full, you make a system call to write the, the contents of the entire buffer. And then for terminate, um, if the buffer is not empty and there's a terminate, you make a system call to write the contents and if the buffer was dynamically allocated, you, you deallocate it, so you free up the memory. So what about flushing an output buffer? It allows a programmer to force data into a buffer to be written. The motivation is for, for batch programs, it, it forces the, the data to, to disk. For interactive programs, it, it forces data to be sent over a network. 
like a single keystroke when asking for a secure um, um, interaction um, using something like SSH, if that's something that you're familiar with. Um, when a flush is called, if, um, uh, if the buffer contains data, you write the data and reset the buffer to empty. And if the buffer is empty, you the flush sim simply has no effect. Um, in terms of implementation of the flush function and the terminate, so in pseudocode, if the buffer is currently empty, you don't do any action. If a buffer is not empty, a system call has, causes a, a write the contents of the buffer um, and set the global pointer to the address of the first byte of the buffer. And if you have a terminate, then it calls the flush, which we talked about here, and then it deallocates de the buffer. Here's some more um, pseudocode um, for buffering on an input. You, you allocate the buffer, point correctly. Um, then if the bumper, buffer is empty, you make a system call to fill the entire buffer. And then you extract a byte D from the position in the buffer, giving the pointer P, move um, P to the next byte and return D to the caller. And for terminate, if the buffer was dynamically allocated, you deallocate it. So you buffer the input, you do it, and then you, you finish up and you release the memory. Analysis of buffering, um, in terms of implementation, both input and output buffering are straightforward. Only a trivia, trivial, amount, trivial amount of code is necessary to do that. In terms of effectiveness, the buffer of size n reduces the, the number of system calls by a factor of n. And so for an example, when a buffering character, um, that is a, a byte, output, uh, a buffer of only 8K bytes reduces system calls by a factor of 8,192. So what's the relationship between buffering and caching? The concepts are closely related. The chief difference is caching is designed for random access. Buffering is designed for sequential access. So let's talk about an example of IO functions that buffer. In the standard input output library in Unix, it contains many functions. And so um, more specific examples of um, open, get, read, write, print, flush, and close. And we see that they, they're started with this, this F. And so the set up a buffer, um, it, it, Buffered the input of one byte, buffered the input of multiple bytes, um, buffered the output of many bytes, buffered the output of a formatted data, et cetera. And so this is uh, just examples of these functions. Um, so each function uses buffers extensively and it dramatically improves the input output performance. So um, we got into more specifics about how programmers use um, I.O. And so the two aspects of I.O. pertinent to programmers is device interface. Um, it, it's important to system programmers who write device drivers. And the relative cost of input output is important to application programmers. So how much overhead, how much time, how difficult it is to do I.O. operations, how do you go about doing that? So in terms of device drivers, it's, it's divided into three parts. The upper half is called by the application. The lower half is handled by the device driver. And then there's shared data across both halves. Uh, variables was one of the ways that we talked about having um, some type of a, a buffer that could also be there as well. Buffering is a fundamental technique used to enhance performance. One of those things is having lots of experience and um, computer um, um, capabilities. This is one of the things that has come up as clearly something that does help with performance in a lot of ways. So it's useful with both input and output. And the buffer of size n reduces the system calls by a factor of n. So another useful bit of information to remember. All right, well, thank you very much. That ends our lecture, and we're also done with this third major section in Coomer. Take care. Bye-bye.